in the chat already. So I suggest we are going to start the program of our last uh, day. To this morning, Fabio Medilla will start with a presentation on uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia and non-CF bronchiectasis. And then Nicola Regami will take over and start with the first presentation of this day on cystic fibrosis. So um, very curious what they are going to tell us uh, this morning. So Fabio, please, you can start. Okay. Good morning to uh, everybody. I will start with the non-CF bronchiectasis and then on the second part of my presentation, I will move to primary cilia dyskinesia. Uh, the real epidemiology, I mean, the incidence of uh, uh, bronchiectasis in children is not really uh, well known, but uh, it varies between uh, four uh, cases every 100,000 of children, uh, comparing to adults, that is, uh, the incidence is 52 cases uh, uh, over 100,000 uh, patient person. Uh, it is still an important cause of chronic suppurative Lyme disease in low income countries. And we know that there is a decline in prevalence in the high income countries in the last uh, uh, 50 years because of the wide uh, use of antibiotics. Uh, which is the definition of non-CF bronchiectasis? Uh, non-CF bronchiectasis are a dilatation of their ways that is supported by the radiological and clinical evidence. And we'll see later on which are the clinical symptoms of children with bronchiectasis. The bronchiectasis can be divided in cylindrical, varicose, and cystic. When you have a cystic bronchiectasis, uh, uh, the lesion of the bronchial airways is irreversible. And about the pathophysiology, there is a vicious circle between infection, inflammation, and tissue uh, damage. Here are reported uh, the most common cause uh, of uh, uh, the etiology for uh, bronchiectasis. When uh, you have a child with bronchiectasis, you should always uh, rule out uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, the presence of uh, immunodeficiency, and we'll see later on which are the most common immunodeficiencies that are associated with uh, non-CF bronchiectasis, uh, infection, and this is important especially in low-income country, recurrent pulmonary uh, aspiration that the consequence of uh, impaired airway protection as it happened in the children with uh, uh, cerebral palsy or uh, the child with structural anom anomaly of the upper or lower airways. And we discussed this uh, why the next uh, 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 two days ago. Uh, the child may have a congenital structural lung malformation. We discussed this already. You should rule out primary cilia dyskinesia, and we'll discuss about this later on. Retain foreign body, and then there is a miscellaneous of uh, condition like post chemotherapy, post irradiation, allergic to pulmonary aspergillosis, smoke inhalation, autoimmune condition, and yellow name syndrome. Unfortunately, 17 to 40 percent of the children with non CF bronchiectasis have idiopathic non-CF, idiopathic bronchiectasis because it's not possible to find a, a cause. The etiology depends uh, a lot on the region of the world. Primary immunodeficiency is the main cause in a developed uh, country and infection in uh, low-income uh, countries. Uh, this is a study that was published uh, uh, some years ago on uh, more than uh, uh, 900 patients, and uh, they confirmed what I, saw, I told you before, that in 30% of the cases there were no association with an etiology cause, 19% uh, were secondary to infection, and 17% were second, uh, secondary to primary immunodeficiency, and only 7% were secondary to primary cilia dyskinesia. Uh, here are reported uh, uh, the most common uh, uh, immunodeficiency that are associated with non-CF bronchiectasis in childhood. And uh, as you can see, 70, more than 70% of the kids that have non-CF bronchiectasis and immunodeficiency have uh, B-cell disorders. Uh, T-cell disorders uh, combine, combine immunodeficiency and other kind of immunodeficiency are much more uh, rare comparing to B-cell disorders. On the right part of these slides, you see which are the most common uh, uh, bugs 
uh, and viruses that are associated to non-CF bronchiectasis. And among uh, bacteria, uh, the most uh, uh, common bacteria you can isolate from the sputum of children with non-CF bronchiectasis is Haemophilus influenzae. Uh, about the viruses, we know the adenovirus, HIV, measles, and influenza may as be associated to bronchiectasis. Remember about Bordetella pertussis and uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, so, which are the symptoms when you should suspect uh, a patient uh, with uh, to have uh, a child to have uh, bronchiectasis? First of all, when you have a child with chronic productive cough that lasts at more than eight weeks. If you have a child with asthma that is not responsible to treatment, I think that you have heard that uh, asthma is the easiest uh, diagnosis that you can do in a child, but you should be always very careful about the differential uh, diagnosis, especially when you have a child that is not responding to the uh, proper medication. And you should suspect bronchiectasis when you have an inc incomplete resolution of pneumonia after treatment or recurrent pneumonia. When you have a child with persistence and unexplained lung crackles, and when you have a child with respiratory symptoms and, and uh, uh, with structural or functional disorders of esophagus or of the upper uh, respiratory tract. And finally, when you have a child with episode of hemoptysis. How you make the diagnosis? The gold standard, as we heard yesterday morning, for the diagnosis of bronchiectasis in children, nowadays is high resolution CT scan that has a sensitivity of 97%. There are several scores that you can use uh, with CT, but probably uh, the one that is uh, more used is the BALA score, uh, where you study the internal luminal diameter that usually is greater than the adjacent blood uh, vessels. And in this case, you should suspect uh, the presence of, of uh, bronchiectasis. We heard also, yes, that also magnetic resonance image may have uh, some role in the diagnosis, but mainly in the follow-up uh, of patients that have uh, bronchiectasis. About uh, blood tests and other uh, uh, tests, when you have a child with bronchiectasis, you should always uh, rule out uh, cystic fibrosis and primary ischemia dyskinesia. So you should ask for a sweat test and see which examination we should uh, perform for PCD. About uh, uh, immunological screening, because as I told you, in uh, high income countries, uh, uh, immunodeficiency is the most common cause of non CF bronchiectasis. You should uh, do a C reactive protein, blood well cell count. Uh, uh, immunological uh, immunoglobulin specific antibodies you should always rule out uh, uh, HIV uh, total Ig specific Ig for aspergillus uh, response to uh, vaccination and then you should study lymphocytes to set the profilation tests of the lymphocyte another uh, killer cells activity and you also uh, should uh, study phagocyte function and uh, complement uh, uh, function. Now, uh, we'll uh, discuss about follow-up and treatment uh, on non-CF patient uh, together with PCD. So we move now to uh, PCD. We all know that PCD is a genetic disorder that is characterized by impaired ciliar function that leads to diverse several clinical manifestations, such, for example, chronic semopulmonary disease, persistent middle ear effusion, la laterality defects, and infertility. The incidence of PCD in the normal population is uh, between one case every 12,000 12, children to one every 20,000 uh, children. But when we uh, consider the prevalence in children with repeat respiratory infection, the prevalence is much higher, is around 5%. Remember that 50% of the patients with PCD have associated situs viscerum uh, inversus. So we know that uh, PCD is, a, a, in a, is an heterogeneous disorder that is involved a uh, multiple genes with an autosomal recessive pertinence of inheritance. And uh, we know that mutation in any of the 100 proteins that is involved in ciliary assembly, structure or function can cause the disease. To date, uh, there are more than 40 different genes 
that have been linked to PCD and we'll discuss which are the most uh, uh, common. We know that uh, uh, motile cilia move fluids and mucus from conducted airways, paranasal sinuses, and the stachian tube. And we know that the not only the respiratory epithelium, but the respiratory epithelium is lined by ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And uh, each epithelial cell has 200 uniform motile cilia that are anatomically and functionally oriented in the same direction. I think that uh, uh, we all know that the, the uh, characteristic structure of the cilia, uh, that is nine plus two arrangement. And as I told you, uh, we know that the cilia is composed than more than 100 proteins. So here is the diagram, diagram of a normal ultrastructure of the ciliary axonem. This is a transverse section, and you can see the most important uh, part of the cilia are the outer dynamic arm, the inner dynamic arm, central microtubal pair, radial spokes, next in dynamic regular complex, and microtubular doublet. So a problem, and a structural anomaly of all this structure can be led to uh, primary cilia dyskinesia. Uh, the movement of the cilia is uh, uh, very complex. There is a stroke phase. There is a recovery phase. We know that the cilia bit frequency is uh, between 1,000 and 1,500 bit per minute. And we know that the mucocilia transport is able to transport the mucus to three centimeters each minute. So which are the clinical manifestation of primary cilia dyskinesia? We know that the major clinical presentation are uh, connected to the respiratory tract, but you can have also manifestation of the genital urinary tract. You can have left right orientation defect, and you can have also problem of the central nervous system. About the respiratory tract, we all know that you can have a problem on the lung, uh, in the middle ear and the paranasal sinuses. Uh, you can have a male and female infertility. Situs uh, inversus, as I told you, in 50% of the patient, aerotaxi, and con some congenital heart disease. And about central nervous system, you can have uh, idiocephalus and retinitis pigmentosa. So we have seen which are the clinical symptoms, the clinical manifestation, but in this slide, uh, you can see the clinical ma the manifestation associated to the age of the patient. So there are some typical findings in the antenatal period, in the newborn period, in childhood, adolescent, and adults. In childhood adolescents, the symptoms are very similar. There are some characteristic uh, symptom newborn period, for example, a full-term neonates that present uh, respiratory distress without any clinical reason, or in the antenatal period, uh, a child with my fetal cerebral ventriculomegaly or with situs inversus uh, uh, totalis. Remember that 50% of the patient at the age of eight years may develop bronchiectasis if they are not well followed. So, uh, I've shown you the clinical presentation. Now, which patient should be referred for diagnostic testing? Which of these diagnostic testing should be performed? I'm sure that you all know which are the most important tests that are for the diagnosis, that are nasal nitric oxide, high-speed video microscopy analysis, transmission electron microscopy, genotype, and immunofluorescence for ciliar proteins. But which, and finally, which treatment should these children perform? So uh, in 2016, the uh, ERS published uh, the results of the uh, task force. I have the honor to participate on the diagnosis of primary cilia dyskinesia. The task force was uh, organized with six PICO questions relevant for clinical care, a systematic review of 20 years of literature, grading of the quality of evidence, and deciding the strength of evidence. And the ADELP survived was used to develop a diagnostic algorithm. So uh, first of all, which patient should be referred for diagnostic test? Uh, on the task force, it was decided 
patients with wet cough, situs anomalies, congenital cardiac defect, rhinitis, chronic middle ear disease, history in term infants on neonatal respiratory symptoms. Uh, they should recommend to perform the test also in patients with normal CETO, but with symptoms suggestive of PCD, sibling of patients with symptoms suggestive of PCD, and uh, uh, patients with uh, a predictive tools uh, with PICARD. PICARD is a, uh, is, a, is a predictive score for PCD with seven simple questions to predict the likelihood of having PCD. And the score goes from zero to 14. And what has been demonstrated uh, that if you have a score over 10, you have a, a, a prob probability to develop, to have a PCD over 92%. So let's see the technique, the, the diagnostic technique. Uh, uh, the first one is a, a nasal nitroxide. Nasal nitroxide measurements should be used as part of the diagnostic workup in all children aged over six years, and it should perform with a chemiluminescence analyzer with the venom closer technique. It's recommended also in children less than six years but the measurement should be used, uh, should be done using tidal briefing. And the patient with a strong clinical history should undergo further testing also, even if uh, nasal oxynitrocyte is normal. High speed lead analysis uh, uh, to whom should be done? Celia bit frequency and pattern analysis should be used as part of the diagnostic workup. You will see that this is one of the major differences between the European and the North American uh, uh, physician, because in Europe, uh, we recommend the use of high-speed video analysis. Uh, on the contrary, in North America, they uh, consider that this test is not su sufficiently standardized to rule out PCD. Remember that when you do this study, you should uh, study not only the frequency of the bit, uh, the bit frequency, but also the partner of uh, the uh, bit. Microscopic uh, electron microscopy for many years it has been done. It, this test, test was the gold standard for the diagnosis uh, of PCD. Uh, cilia ultrastructure should be used in patients that is suspected of having PCD, and uh, further investigation should be performed. Uh, in patient with normal ultrastructure if the clinical history is strong. So remember that uh, you may have a patient with PCD with a normal ultrastructure of the cilia, but they have a problem in the movement of the cilia. Uh, in patient uh, with, where you demonstrate the presence of ciliary ultrastructure that are diagnostic for uh, PCD, you shouldn't perform other diagnostic investigation and uh, uh, electron microscopy is considered nowadays a highly specific test to confirm the diagnosis of PCD. Uh, so who should perform genotype? It is possible now to identify genetic causation in 50 to 75% of the cases of PCD, uh, but the sensitivity of the genetic testing for PCD is still low because uh, as, uh, as I told you, Celia uh, uh, had more than 100 proteins, so there are a lot of genes that can control uh, the protein. And the genotyping is useful when the confirmation of the diagnosis is difficult by other approaches, but the detection of two mutation that uh, can cause the disease is slightly specific. And remember that there is a correlation between mutation, genetic, and clinical course, especially for the genes that control in the DNA arm and the central apparatus defect. And this, what I, I said just before, you see that there are some genes that control outer DNA arm, some genes that control in the DNA arm and axonem organization, or other that control outer and inner DNA arm and central apparatus on, on, uh, uh, for a normal ultrastructure. We know that when you have uh, the association between the genes that control the inner DNA arm uh, 
disorganization, uh, it's an M organization and the central apparatus, you have the most severe cases. Some years ago was published a very interesting paper studying the association between uh, mutation, uh, ultrastructural defect, a clinical course of the patient. Finally, immunofluorescence should be used in immunofluorescence as a diagnostic tool. Uh, with immunofluorescence, you can study specific antibody that can localize the protein in human respiratory epithelial cells. There are now many antibody against serial proteins that are available, outer, inner, DNA in arm, radial spoke head, DNA in regulatory complex, uh, and many studies have used immunofluorescence to examine protein mislocation related to gene mutation. And uh, uh, immunofluorescence can be identified, can be used to identify mislocation of protein PCD patient, providing information on the pathogenicity of a, a mutation. But nowadays, it's not considered a first line examination and diagnosis of PCD. And here are the uh, proteins that you can look uh, associated with immunofluorescence associated to microtubular doublet, outer DNA arm, nexin, inner DNA arm, radial spoke, head. So uh, as I told you, nowadays there are two uh, mainly publication on the uh, guidelines uh, on how to perform uh, the diagnosis of PCD. The first document was published by the ERS in 2016. They public a diagnostic algorithm that is uh, uh, organized in three steps. Step one, they recommended uh, nasal notoroxide and high-speed uh, bead analysis. In step two, uh, micro electromicroscopy and cell culture plus uh, high-speed video analysis. And in step three, the genetic test. On the contrary, uh, the uh, American, uh, uh, American Tragic Society published in 2018 uh, a statement on uh, uh, how to perform the diagnosis of PCD. And the statement was based mainly on clinical uh, condition and uh, on nasal uh, nitroxide. So the, uh, the American Trial Society recognized four clinical symptoms that are unexplained neonatal respiratory children, uh, uh, respiratory distress in term infants. Here, here around the daily cough beginning before six months of age, uh, nasal congestion beginning uh, before the six months of age, and organ laterality, laterality defect. If a child has at least two of these clinical conditions, you should perform a nasal nitroxide test uh, with chemiluminescence apparatus. And uh, if uh, you have a low uh, uh, concentration of nasal uh, nitroxide, you have the diagnosis of PCD. In the case that you cannot do the test, you should uh, go on with uh, uh, electromicroscopy and genetic uh, testing. So which are the main difference between the, uh, uh, the documents published by the European Respiratory Society and the one published by the American Thoracic Society? First of all, the structure of the document. The, uh, the publication by the ERS is uh, evidence-based guidelines. The publication by the American Thoracic Society is a consensus statement. Uh, in the ERS, it was proposed a diagnostic algorithm. In the American Thoracic Statement, uh, there were two major clinical criteria plus at least one diagnostic test. And the major difference is uh, on high-speed video analysis because uh, in Europe, uh, we consider uh, an important test in the North America, they consider uh, this test not uh, uh, still reliable because uh, you need a lot of expertise. So now let's uh, go on, on with the treatments, which are the goals of the treatment to control symptoms, reduce exacerbation, improve quality of life, prevent lung damage, maintain lung function, facilitate normal growth and develop, early detection and treatment of complication. Uh, if possible, you should use a disease-specific uh, treatment. Uh, there is very low levels of evidence uh, on the international literature, which is the best treatment. There are small trials of short duration, and mainly the results are extrapolated from a CF curve. 
I can tell you that is uh, probably in the near future, we will be, uh, uh, DRS will publish uh, guidelines of uh, the results of the task force on the, uh, what is uh, around in the literature on the treatment on CF, non-CF bronchiectasis. So this is a very interesting study that was published in 2012, where uh, they compare with the questionnaire uh, the treatment of PCD in different uh, uh, European uh, country. Uh, it was divided in uh, West European countries, uh, South European countries, North uh, and East. And uh, they already considered in 2012 uh, the British island out of Brexit. So they consider a different uh, group of, uh, uh, of people. And you can see from this slide that uh, almost uh, in uh, all European countries, uh, the two uh, treatment, the main treatment were highway clearance and antibody for exacerbation. Uh, and these are the results of uh, a guideline of a task force that was published some years ago by the RS on the uh, uh, treatment of, uh, of these children. And uh, here are the results. Airway clearance and physiokinesis therapy and physical exercise should be uh, always prescribed. Uh, uh, acute airway infection should be promptly cured with antibiotic. Long-term use of nebulized anti-pseudomonas antibiotics in patients chronic infected with pseudomonas aeruginosa should be considered. Prophylactic or antibiotics should be not be given to all PCD patients, but should be considered if repeated course of oral uh, course of oral antibiotic for acute exacerbation. Uh, you should use asthma treatment only when you have a clinical demonstration that these children have associated uh, asthma. Uh, and the inhaled bronchodilator should not be given to all patients. There is no role for an uh, acetylcysteine, anti-inflammatory uh, medication. All children with PCD or non-CF bronchiectasis should receive childhood immunization. It should be, uh, uh, in the family should be discouraged uh, passive and active smoke. Uh, about chronic uh, treatment, there, there have been uh, some publication on uh, uh, the long term of uh, azithromycin, and it was demonstrated that with azithromycin there are less exacerbation, increased time to first exacerbation, uh, alternative F1 decline, and better quality of life. And uh, there is also some data on long term inhale uh, areas, uh, uh, antibiotic treatment for the education of pseudomonas reginosa. And uh, there should be encouraged to a reduction of exposure to environmental pollutant. Same seminal analysis should be recommended in mates with PCD. Ventilation tubes should be avoided where possible, and regular sputum culture should be performed. So, in conclusion, non CF bronchiectasis, infection, and immunodeficiency this the most, are the most common cause. 17 to 40 percent are known cause. Treatment should uh, not, uh, there are not evidence based, uh, but uh, uh, now uh, what we use is uh, what we know from uh, CF. And uh, uh, the treatment on CF bronchiectasis are very similar to uh, the treatment of PCD. PCD is a rare disease that should be suspected in case of an explained respiratory symptoms. A nasal nitroxide screening test is, uh, uh, should be performed only in diagnostic uh, specialized centers. and. Uh, uh, the treatment of this patient uh, should be a multidisciplinary treatment and monitoring. So let's move to our uh, question. The first one, a five-year-old boy presented with a history of an explained respiratory distress after a normal birth, daily cough and daily nasal congestion beginning before six months of age. His full blood count was normal. His IgA level uh, is IgA uh, low, but IgG and GEM normal which is of the following is the most likely uh, diagnosis. Chronic bronchiectasis, common variable immunodeficiency, gastroesophageal reflux with aspiration, immotile chilia syndrome, schwann diamond syndrome. I think that we can vote. So remember, it's a history of an explained uh, respiratory distress after a normal birth and daily cough and daily nasal congestion beginning before six months of age. So we can see the result, I think now, of the vote. And uh, uh, I think that uh, most of you uh, gave the, the right answer. Immotile cilia syndrome is the right uh, answer because this child has two 
uh, three clinical symptoms, unexplained respiratory distress at birth, and uh, uh, chronic nasal congestion, chronic cough since the age of six months. So let's move to the, to the second question. Uh, which of the following organism is the most common initial pathogen cultured from the sputum on non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis uh, patient? Hemophysis influenzae, Moraxella catarralis, Mycobacterium avium, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Staphylococcus aureus. So uh, we can open the boat that is already open. And uh, I think that this uh, uh, answer is uh, quite uh, uh, easy, in my opinion. So can we see the vote? So uh, I agree with you. The, the right uh, answer is Hemophysis influenza. And more than 70% of uh, you gave the right uh, answer. And so let's move to the last question. Which, so you see, Hemophysis influenza is the right Answer. Which of the following statement on PCD is correct? In a case of situs inversus, the chance of having PCD is around 25%. 50% of the patient PCD may have normal electromicroscopy finding. 50% of children PCD may have bronchiectasis at the age of eight years. Nasal uh, nitroxide less than 30 as a sensitivity of 50% for PCD. So I think that we can uh, see the, the, the vote. So this was a quite, uh, it's a little more difficult question. I agree with uh, the 48% of you the right, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, the right, yes, the right uh, answer is that 50% of the children with PCD may have bronchiectasis at the age of eight if they are not followed properly in a center for, uh, in a, for a respiratory system children. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Fabio, for this very clear overview, including all the recent literature. I suggest that we take the questions uh, now because Nicola will talk about CF, which is a little bit, uh, well, <laughs> quite different from PCD and non-CF bronchiectasis. Um, if I look at the questions, there are some questions on um, treatment and some on diagnostics. Maybe let's start with the treatment questions. Um, can you discuss uh, the treatment of non-CF bronchiectasis a little bit? Um, is there a place for inhaled antibiotics for treatment against pseudomonas for azithromycin? What do you think about that? Okay, so as uh, uh, I, I said during my presentation, unfortunately, uh, there are uh, no uh, big uh, randomized clinical trials on the treatment of this patient because the number of patients uh, are very uh, small. So all what we know uh, comes from the treatment of patients with CF. So there are not clear uh, demonstration of uh, the useful of uh, chronic antibiotic, for example. Uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, evidence, I mean, some evidence, clear evidence that you should treat prom, uh, right away acute exacerbation with an antibiotic for at least 10 days. And the choice of the antibiotic is usually uh, amoxicillin plus clonovatic acid, because as I told you, I'll show you, amoxicillin influenza is the most common uh, immunological uh, agent. About the pseudomonas, there are conflict results on, uh, the, on what we should treat or not treat patient with pseudomonas infection, because there are some evidence that the child with PCD may have uh, Pseudomonas infection, uh, and uh, you can uh, isolate the, the, the pseudomonas and then can disappear without any treatment. But uh, uh, what I can tell you that uh, if you have a pseudomonas, you should, uh, it's recommended at least uh, a trial uh, for pseudomonas uh, infection. About chronic uh, treatment, as I showed you, there are some data on azithromycin. It seems that azithromycin may reduce the number of exacerbation, may improve the quality of life, but there are also some side effects like diarrhea 
or uh, bacterial uh, resistance. And for Pseudomonas uh, colonization, uh, the treatment is exactly the same than on the CF uh, patients. So the major treatment is uh, acute treatment of the acute exacerbation, uh, avoid uh, all pol pollant, uh, pollution and uh, uh, immunization. Okay, and do you think there's a place for other CF treatments in non-CF bronchiectasis or PCD like DNAs? There is some data on uh, uh, hypertonic saline. There are some data on the use of hypertonic saline. There are no data on DNAs. I no think there are, there are even some suggestions that DNAs may worsen the condition yeah, in right. PCD. Right. Yeah. And th but then I there are a lot of questions about uh, diagnostics. Um, what is the preferred site to take a biopsy for uh, uh, okay. PCD? The best, the best way to do a biopsy is in the nose because it has uh, with less side effects. So in our center, we always uh, do uh, the brushing, not the biopsy, because you don't have to take too much material. Uh, so we do the brushing of uh, the nose. That is uh, in 90% uh, of the cases, we success with that. Only when we have a child that has a, a rhinitis, where we try the brushing several times and we didn't have any uh, cells, we do uh, the, bio, uh, the, the brushing through bronchoscopy and usually in, over the main carina. Okay, and, and a question which I saw twice, is there a place for uh, mucociliary clearance tests with saccharine uh, or others? Uh, this was a very old test. Uh, we don't use this test anymore. I know that there are some center that uh, study mucoclear cilia with the with the scan with the uh, uh, nuclear medicine. We used to do that many many years ago, but there is no standardization of the technique. So I think there is no role now in diagnosis of using this test. Uh, to study uh, mucociliar clearance. Okay, and maybe a last question, and well, there are a lot of questions coming in now, so maybe you can answer can them answer later. Them. Yeah, yeah. But maybe a last question, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, do you have any data about the prevalence of non-CF bronchiectasis in children with neurodevelopmental problems and chronic aspiration? Uh, as I told you at the beginning, uh, a study on the epidemiology of bronchitis in children are very uh, low, are very few, and uh, um, we, I don't, I'm not, I don't know if uh, these children, there are study on uh, the incidence of uh, bronchitis, non-CF bronchitis in these children, but probably they have a higher incidence because we know that these kids may have uh, often a uh, respiratory infection. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Fabio. Um, Fabio will have a look at the other questions in the chat, and we will continue with Nicolas Regami. Um, it's my pleasure to reintroduce you, uh, Nicolas. Uh, Nicolas is from Lutzen, and I'm uh, convinced that he will give a very good presentation on CF. He will start with genetics, pathophysiology, and diagnosis in this uh, slot of the course. And after a short break, uh, he will talk about CF lung disease and uh, extrapulmonary manifestations of CF. So please, uh, Nicola. Thank you very much, uh, Marielle. A very good morning to everyone. I hope you hear me. Um, I have uh, in all these talks a few conflicts of interest with the companies because um, I've been uh, in several advisory boards and we also have received uh, money from various companies to perform research at different institutions where I've worked with. So what I try to show you is um, that genetics are now important in CF. Uh, when I started uh, studying or so learning our CF, it was just saying, well, don't care about genetics, it's just CF, but it's not so anymore. Uh, we'll talk about the pathophysiology and especially how now to diagnose um, CF uh, in the era of newborn screening. And I'd like to show you that we don't try nowadays to treat symptoms, but to treat preventatively before symptoms appear in cystic fibrosis. So I hope you all know that uh, cystic fibrosis uh, is caused by a defect of a chloride channel that's localized at the apical um, 
site of some epithelial cells in the body and that this channel regulates not only um, uh, its conduction of uh, chloride but also the activity of another channel a sodium channel which is responsible for reabsorption of sodium in the epithelial cells so the channel the cftr down regulates this enac channel uh, cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder and in European countries we have about one of 25 people who are healthy carriers of a mutated CFTR gene. They're completely healthy but if they have a partner who is also um, carrying the gene, mutated gene, they have a one to four chance of having a child with cystic fibrosis and so the incidence in Europe of cystic fibrosis is about one to 2,500. It's much less in other countries, in other continents, Asia or Africa, but um, we start seeing cystic fibrosis in several countries and in my uh, uh, hospital, the two last patients we have diagnosed is one patient from um, Ethiopia, Ethiopia and one patient from Syria. There are more than 2,000 CFTR mutations that have been reported, and but only less than 10% of these are disease producing. This is important to know. You might have um, a, a mutation in your CFTR gene which does not cause disease. And if you don't know if it's causing disease or not, this is a very important website to look at from the John Hopkins Hospital. It will tell you if uh, the mutation that you have found in your patient is of clinical significance. If you get uh, lab results from your genetic lab, you might have something like this coming and you might be a little bit uh, perturbed because this is a new nomenclature and we very often use this old one but if you get this result or something like this, you might Google and to see really what is the kind of the old uh, nomenclature that is still used very much in clinics. I said genetics are important. I show you especially later why this is so. So from the mutations of the CFTR, they are the majority of the mutations are so-called a minimal CFTR function mutations. So there's no or minimal function of the gene. In class one, you have no protein that is produced at all. In the most common mutation, F500A deletion, there is a protein that is produced, but it's degraded in the cytosol, so it doesn't reach the apical surface of the cell, so it cannot work. Class three mutation, you have the channel at the surface, but it does not work. And in the residual CFGR um, function mutations, uh, which are very few. You usually have a mild phenotype, mostly patient or some of the patient might be pancreas sufficient. And here you have either less function, less protein um, uh, coming in or a less stable CFTR at the surface of your epithelial cells. So we go to the pathophysiology. What happens in the, oh, sorry, um, there's one miss. Um, the CFTR gene is expressed on many epithelial cells uh, in the whole body, and therefore it's a multisystemic disease. From the mutation that you have, you can quite predict what will be the pancreatic phenotype, um, if the child might develop diabetes or liver disease, but it's very variable for lung disease. Um, and for lung disease, there are many, many other um, uh, things that play a role, like, for instance, um, uh, the genetic background, modifier genes, um, or especially also the treatment that the patient will have. The main organs that are affected are the lung, the liver, the pancreas, the gastrointestinal tract, reproductive tract. So what happens in the, in the sweat glands? In the sweat glands, you know, your, our body um, wants to sweat to regulate the temperature of the body. So we want to have uh, uh, water going uh, out to, to cool the body, but we want to keep the salt. So the ch CFTR channel is important to reabsorb sodium in the body. So if this doesn't work, we will lose salt in our um, sweat. And this is also how we mainly make the test of cystic fibrosis using the sweat test. And the sweat chloride reflects very well the CFTR function in children um, who have uh, almost well, mutation with almost no CFTR function, um, you will have very high levels of sweat. And in children 
whether a residual function uh, of the CFTR protein, you will have lower sweat tests. The diagnostic cutoff to say for its CF is 60 millimoles per liter. So CF diagnosis, uh, you can make it with this algorithm. If you have a presentation clinically of cystic fibrosis, either with a positive newborn screening or clinical signs of symptom compatible with cystic fibrosis, you come to that, or a family history positive for cystic fibrosis, for instance, um, a sibling, then you will perform a sweat chloride testing. If the sweat chloride is um, higher than 60 mol per liter, well, you can, well, you have to do this on two occasions. Importantly, you have a CF diagnosis. If it's lower than 29 millimol per liters, it's very unlikely that you have CF. In the intermediate range, you usually have to proceed to complete CFTR genetic analysis, which you will anyway have to do um, for adapting your treatment. But for the diagnosis, you will do this at this step here. If you have two CF causing CFTR mutations, you can give the diagnosis of CF. But if you don't have any uh, CFTR mutation, it's unlikely. And if you have some mutations of unknown significance, then you can go on to physiological testing, for instance, with nasal potential difference measurements or intestinal current measurements, where you really measure the function of the CFTR channel. And this can help you give you also a diagnosis, yes or not, of cystic fibrosis. Shortly about the sweat test. Um, so you measure the chloride uh, with stimulating your sweat glands uh, with pilocarpine uh, iontophoresis. You collect the sweat and you look in your lab at the sweat chloride. Um, it should be in these uh, values. And if you have twice a test, um, which is pathological, you can put the diagnosis. There are other methods that look indirectly at the um, sweat uh, the chloride content on the sweat by measuring the uh, conductivity of the sweat. These are tests that are not um, used as diagnostic tools, but they are good screening tools. They have a little bit other normal values because you don't, don't measure the conductivity just only of the chloride, but also of other ions. Newborn screening nowadays is the way that most um, patients are diagnosed uh, with cystic fibrosis in most countries in the Western world. And all the screening tests, they start by measuring the immunoreactive uh, trypsinogens in uh, the uh, blood that you take at the th third or fourth day of life in your newborn child. And then there are different protocols if you measure other proteins in the blood or if you directly measure some genes in the blood. Uh, but if the positive screening uh, child, you need to confirm then if it is CF or not CF by doing a sweat test. You can diagnose more than 90% uh, of the children with cystic fibrosis um, with a newborn screening. A few will be missed. And uh, if there you have a situation where after newborn screening, you cannot really say, is it CF or, or is it not CF? For instance, because um, you have then an intermediate uh, sweat test and maybe just one mutation of CFTR, we call these children in Europe um, cystic fibrosis screen positive inconclusive diagnosis. So how do we manage uh, these patients? Well, this is very uh, difficult for the, for, the, for the families because they are insecure. Um, you will have to follow the children over time and to repeat the sweat testing. If you, uh, just two words about this. Uh, other main possibilities to test your um, uh, cystic fibrosis diagnosis with electrophysiological tests if your genetic is inconclusive or if your uh, sweat test is inconclusive. Um, this is, for instance, the nasal potential different measurements where you can see different traces between normals and uh, cystic fibrosis patients. Cystic fibrosis patients have a large response to the block of uh, sodium channels with amyloride, and they will have no response to stimulation of your CFTR channels with uh, azoproteinol uh, chloride-free solution. So what's happening in the lung, the pathophysiology? Well, this is the most important organ that you will have to follow because it's basically the organ that uh, leads in major, uh, the majority of the patient to death. Well, you have a problem of the air liquid 
uh, surface air surface liquid, which is depleted because of this hyperactivity of the um, sodium channel. And this leads to impaired mucociliary clearance. Your little hairs cannot beat correctly the cilia to put the mucus away. You have airway obstruction, then the bacteria come. Um, the bacteria that like this mucus, they uh, lead to neutrophilic inflammation. And finally, it's the neutrophilic inflammation that will lead to tissue destruction to bronchiectasis and respiratory failure. Very importantly is to know that cystic lung fibrosis disease starts very early in life. The old studies have, uh, all the studies are here, the ARES studies have already shown that at the age of three months, in, even in asymptomatic children, uh, there will be substantial lung damage that you can already see. And uh, so it is important as a principle that you will start very early your treatments because there is so-called silent lung disease. So in early stages of the diseases where patients are often asymptomatic, maybe they have some respiratory symptoms, you will mainly start uh, mucus clearance, prevent virus infections with immunizations, and if you have first bacterial infections, you will try to eradicate. There are not so many studies about the early uh, treatments of cystic fibrosis because um, uh, lots of infants or well, uh, studies have not been so much done in infants and young children. And also in this age group, we don't have uh, many good endpoints to look uh, for the response to treatment. So what will you start uh, treatment with? Chest physiotherapy. That's certainly the main stem of the uh, uh, treatment of cystic fibrosis lung disease. You have different techniques. Positive expiratory pressure techniques might be the most effective. And important is to tell the parents that exercise is very good for children with cystic fibrosis, but it does not replace your physiotherapy. The other treatment that you will start very early in cystic fibrosis patient are inhalations um, with uh, hydrators of this airway, airway liquid surface, um, airway surface liquid, sorry. And um, the medication that is used the most widely because it's a very um, cheap medication is hypertonic xylem. And it's been shown to be effective even in very uh, small infants in uh, very early age. This is the study of uh, Miriam Stahl in the Brew Journal two years ago, or one year ago now, um, the previous study where uh, they could be shown, they could show uh, that uh, there was a weight improvement and also better lung clearance index if using um, inhalation with hypertonic xylem in these infants. Then comes the bacterial infection in your lung. Um, it starts usually with Staphylococcus aureus and then Haemophilus influenzae would be the second bug that you get. And then uh, very often Pseudomonas aeruginosa as, as a third one, the one that you don't like. And the thing you will have to do at the first manifestation of a bacterial infection is to try to eradicate the bacteria. With Staphylococcus Haemophilus influenzae, usually you will use two to four weeks to oral antibiotics. To for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the recommendation um, is four weeks of inhaled tobramycin as a first-line treatment. These bugs are very difficult um, to eradicate, and with Tenotrophomonas maltophilia, it's very unclear if you really need to eradicate it at the first infection. Some countries do prophylactic antibiotics against Staphylococcus aureus. Some don't. The benefit is really unclear. These are the pros to do this the therapy um, and the cons um, is especially the risk or the fear of having resistance if you do a continuous antibiotic prophylaxis um, for Staphylococcus during several years with antibiotics that you take every year, every year, every day. Prophylactic anti pseudomonas antibiotics are not um, uh, given in, uh, should, in my opinion, not be given. Very few people do that, but there's a risk of toxicity of doing this. So I conclude this first part by uh, repeating this very important website uh, to look at your mutations, to think um, that most of the uh, 
CF diagnosis are made at birth with the newborn screening, but still think about CF in all the child with symptoms. Um, the detailed pathophysiology is unclear, but it's certainly this low volume hypothesis with the depletion of the airway surface liquid. And um, we now try not to follow uh, to treat symptoms, but really to treat preventatively the children. So I have now a few um, uh, MCQ questions, multiple choice questions. Um, I'd be very happy to answer all the questions um, in the second sessions. Uh, we just have five minutes left in this uh, first session, uh, but the other talks will be a little bit shorter. So the first question that I have is, which statement about CFTA mutation classes is correct? In CFTR1 mutations, there is impaired trafficking of the CFTR protein. Class 1 to 3 mutations are residual function mutations. The F508 DEL mutation is a minimal function class 3 mutation. Patients with class 4 to 6 mutations are often pancreatic sufficient. And most CFTR mutations are residual function mutations. Okay, so we see here the results. So we have listened very well. So this is correct. Um, patients with class four to six mutations are often pancreatic sufficient. We go to the next one. Second question. A newborn infant is referred for sweat testing because of positive cystic fibrosis newborn screening. His sweat chloride, which is done done twice is 36 small millimole per liter and then 42 millimole per liter. And you find one mutation on one allele of the CFTR gene. In your institution, you cannot do nasal potential different testing or intestinal current measurements. So we cannot do any pathophysiological testing. Uh, so testing of the function really of the channel. So which statement here is correct? The baby has CF, you start CF treatment or the baby has not CF, so you can reassure the parents. You label the baby as CF speed and you repeat the sweat testing. You think the baby has a mild form of CF, you start CF therapy, or you, you think also the baby has a mild form of CF, but you just control this child and you will start therapy as soon as clinical symptoms develop. So this is also absolutely correct. Two thirds of the people have voted have uh, answered the uh, question correctly. So this is, you cannot say if the child has CF or not, you will have to label the child as CF SPID. So screening positive inconclusive diagnosis, and you have to repeat sweat testing until you can decide if it's CF or not. And the last question, I think I have a third one here. The last one, a newborn girl is referred for sweat testing because of positive CF newborn screening. Her sweat chloride is 84 millimole per liter and you find two pathogenic CFT CFTR mutations on genetic analysis. So how will you proceed? You will start hypertonic saline inhalations and chest physiotherapy. You will start DNA inhalations and chest physiotherapy. You start prophylactic anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. You isolate the girl to prevent her from infections. Or you wait until symptoms develop and then give oral antibiotics. And so the vast majority has answered correctly. I'm very happy. So this will be the first step of the treatment that you do.